Hey everyone, welcome to part 3 of our series on tennis. If you've already watched parts 1 and 2, then thank you for tuning in to our full exploration of this amazing ancient city. And if you haven't seen them, you might want to go back and check them out. And while you're at it, we'd really appreciate it if you took a moment to hit that like button down below so you can help our channel to continue to grow and help this video reach more people. What began as one video about tennis eventually became three because there's so much fascinating history here that we kept learning about and wanted to share. It really is a special place, and it should have become one of the most well-known sites in all of Egypt, right up there alongside places like Luxor and the Valley of the Kings. But like we said before, the pristine tombs full of treasures were discovered here at an unlucky time, and Tanis basically missed its rightly deserved chance to be in the global spotlight. What was once a great capital of Egypt is now a site in ruins that most people have never even heard of. Its history is captivating, and its origins stretch way back to a time long before this city was ever built. Most of these stones came from the previous capital called Piramses, which was the home of Ramses the Great, and most of those stones were also reused from an even earlier capital called Amarna. The legacies of these three great cities are all entwined through these broken monuments here They were passed down through many eras of history. The most impressive of them are the huge megalithic stones, and there are many amazing ones here at Tanis. Like these massive blocks weighing tens of tons, or these monolithic columns that display a spectacular degree of craftsmanship, or these huge obelisks that were as high as 50 feet tall and weighed as much as 200 tons. It's incredibly impressive that an ancient and primitive civilization was able to carve such enormous blocks of stone and transport them by river from the other end of Egypt, and then move them again 12 miles over land from Ramses' previous city when they finally ended up here at Tanis. The ancient Egyptians really did accomplish some great feats and had amazing achievements. We find it quite interesting though that so many of the most extraordinary megalithic stoneworks ever made in Egypt are said to have been created by Ramses. He is known for creating some of the most phenomenal statues in Egypt, but he was also perhaps the greatest usurper of all of the pharaohs. So we wonder how many of those great achievements were his, and how many of them did he reclaim from an earlier time? We find his cartouche on monuments all around the country, but just because he carved his name on them does not prove he built them. It is believed that he created these famous megalithic granite colossi at Luxor, which are some of Egypt's most phenomenal works of art. They are attributed to him because his cartouche is inscribed on them, and they are said to have been created in his image, as are the equally impressive statues at places like Karnak and Memphis. But based on his history of reclaiming earlier king's artifacts, we wonder if maybe he didn't actually create these statues. The tallest ones at Luxor are about 45 feet tall and weigh somewhere around 500 tons. They demonstrate some of the most fantastic stone cutting capabilities ever achieved in ancient history. The extremely impressive level of craftsmanship and the sheer scale of these monoliths has led many people to raise questions as to whether the dynastic Egyptians could have possibly had the capabilities to make them. And there are even far bigger ones in Egypt that really raise some questions like this gargantuan colossus at the Ramesseum near Luxor. This one is seriously amazing. Only the torso and the head remain today, but in its original form as a seated pharaoh, this single solid piece of granite would have been around 19 meters or 60 feet tall and is estimated to have weighed an astonishing 1,000 tons. This puts it in the category of one of the most extreme examples of the largest stones ever moved in the history of civilization. The base that it sat on before an earthquake knocked it over is also enormous. Now when it comes to stones this large, we really start to wonder how a relatively primitive civilization was able to move these absolutely humongous monoliths more than 3,000 years ago. It's also said to have been done by Ramses, and as you can see, his cartouche is carved here on the shoulder, but we wonder if it really could have been him who made it. There's clearly two different levels of technological achievements at this site, which makes us think it could have possibly been the works of two different cultures. Ramses' mortuary temple is a perfect example of a dynastic Egyptian structure 
that's made of much smaller and softer limestone blocks stacked on top of each other. As amazing as the temple is, this enormous statue is carved out of one single piece of granite, which is a much harder stone, and it's just orders of magnitude more impressive. It's stones like this that make us question whether the ancient Egyptians even possessed the technological capabilities that would be required to move an object this big. And this one's not even the biggest statue in Egypt. Actually, one of the things that makes Tanis so awesome is that here is where we find the remains of the most extraordinary megalithic statue of them all. This foot is one of the last surviving pieces of what was most likely the largest stone statue ever known to have been carved and transported in the history of the entire world. It was originally a statue of a standing pharaoh, estimated to have been around 27 to 30 meters, or between 88 and a half and 98 and a half feet tall, which is seriously enormous. If you thought the Ramesseum statue was big, this one would have been much bigger. Once again, it's attributed to Ramses because of a faded inscription on the foot. But how many of the largest statues in history can one pharaoh be responsible for creating in one lifetime? This one could have easily weighed over a thousand tons and would have been absolutely an extraordinary piece of work on a scale that no culture has ever reproduced. Today, the tallest standing statues in Egypt are the Colossi of Memnon, said to be created by the pharaoh Amenhotep III. They stand around 18 meters or 60 feet tall and weigh more than 700 tons, which is magnificent, but just imagine standing there gazing up at a statue almost 40 feet taller. Of the largest monoliths ever made in the world, it would have been close to the top of the list alongside the famous unfinished obelisk in Aswan that weighs around 1,200 tons, and the gargantuan blocks left in the quarry at Baalbek in Lebanon. I'm standing next to the stone of the pregnant woman, which weighs around 1,000 tons, and the statue at Tanis would have been a similar size and weight. Intriguingly, those were never moved from the quarry, whereas this statue was transported more than 500 miles from Aswan to Tanis. Although we can't be 100% certain that it was a single piece monolith, when we spoke to the archaeologist here, he said that it was. And to borrow the words of Flinders Petrie, there is no sufficient reason to suppose that it was not carved in one block of stone. Petrie also wrote that it must have been the glory of the capital of the Delta, towering above all the surrounding buildings, a figure seen for miles across the plains, as the sign of the power and magnificence of the great Ramesu a colossus unsurpassed by any monolith of previous or later times. To get a better idea, the temple at Luxor is about 78 feet tall, and it's one of the tallest temples in Egypt. But this statue would have been as much as 20 feet taller than that. What really blew our minds, though, is when the archaeologist told us that there were originally several of these statues, which is just almost unimaginably incredible that ancient people were able to accomplish this staggering achievement more than once. These were true great relics of ancient history, and we wish we could see them today, but unfortunately, at some point in time, they were chopped up into pieces and recycled into blocks to build other structures. We can't even fathom the decision-making process of the person who gave that order to cut up the greatest statues in history for construction material, and we wish we could go back in time and have a little chat with that guy. The chunks of stone were used to build structures like this gateway, where Petrie identified a section where the crown met an ear, segments where the arms connected to the body, a part of a shoulder, chunks of the legs and ankles, and a piece of the left thigh that wore a ribbed dress, which proved that it was a standing pharaoh. He said probably many more chunks of this gateway and the paving stones were cut from the statues as well. The fact that these astonishing artifacts were cut into pieces leaves us with so many unanswered questions like why in the world would anybody cut them up? And when did it happen? The Egyptians were definitely very practical with recycling stones to avoid extra quarrying work, but isn't it odd that they would cut up their most magnificent pieces of art merely for practical use? 
Wouldn't they have cherished Ramses' most brilliant statues as part of the wonderful legacy of their people, instead of destroying their most renowned pharaoh's best works within just a few hundred years of his death? Why didn't a later king preserve them and claim them for himself? They might have been cut up when the previous city of Pir Ramses was moved to Tanis, and we wonder if the massive stones were just too difficult for people to transport over land in one piece. But if the 19th dynasty was supposed to be able to bring them from 500 miles away just a few hundred years earlier, then we would think that the 21st dynasty would be able to move them 12 miles. They were clearly able to move these huge obelisks here, which are also extremely heavy, but it seems like maybe moving the big statues was beyond the limit of their capabilities, or why else would they cut them up? It must have been a sad day when some king gave the order to start demolishing the greatest statues ever made. If they possibly weren't able to move them, then this would lead us to wonder if they maybe weren't even created by the dynastic Egyptians in the first place. Maybe Ramses wasn't even able to move them either, but wanted to claim them as his own, and maybe that's even why he chose to build a city where the statues already stood before his time. He was a king with extraordinary confidence, who wanted to be remembered with an almost godlike status, so it makes sense that he would want to carry on his memory through the greatest artifacts in Egypt, whether or not he built them. We wonder if the dynastic Egyptians were ever even able to move these stones, or maybe they were the works of a previous and more advanced civilization that existed long before their time. The orthodox explanation of how the Egyptians transported stones is that they loaded them on wooden sleds and large teams of men pulled them with ropes over wet sand or perhaps over wooden rollers. Most explanations that are found online only demonstrate moving stones weighing several tons or tens of tons, but can these methods move the largest stones in history that weighed over a thousand tons? This painting from an Egyptian tomb depicts 172 men pulling a sled with a statue estimated to be 7 meters tall and weigh 58 tons. As impressive and awesome as that is, it's hard to imagine pulling a statue that was perhaps 20 times as heavy on a sled like this. Using the same ratio of men to weight, a 1,000 ton stone would require about 3,000 men to pull the sled. They could have used animals like oxen or elephants to help pull it, but either way, it would be an astronomically difficult task. The stones would also have to be lifted from the quarry, maneuvered on and off of boats, and then later raised and set into their final position. There's a lot of theories about how that was done, but nobody can be certain what methods the Egyptians used. They may have elevated the stones by pulling them up earthen ramps, which would be a crazy task for 3,000 men or a bunch of animals, and they could have used different forms of leverage and possibly the removal of sand to get them standing upright into their final position. This would be an arduous and formidable task, especially for the largest monoliths in the world, and it's just hard to imagine these types of primitive methods effectively accomplishing this. The Egyptians definitely did transport enormous obelisks and megaliths, though, by making spectacular large boats to bring them down the Nile River, as shown in this copy of a relief from Queen Hatshepsut's funerary temple. It shows a custom barge loaded with two obelisks, both estimated to be about 28.5 meters or 93.5 feet tall, and weighing around 350 tons each, which is an extremely impressive achievement to move 750 tons of granite on a boat more than 3,000 years ago. The Egyptians clearly could accomplish incredible undertakings, but it's still hard to imagine them using a boat to move one single piece of stone that weighed perhaps more than 300 tons more than that. We're not saying it's impossible, but it just boggles our minds to imagine how it was done, especially compared to how we would accomplish this in modern times. Today, we would use the world's most immensely powerful cranes to lift something that weighs a thousand tons and we haven't even had the modern technology to be able to do so for very long. We would also need big powerful trucks to be able to transport an object that heavy, and the whole operation would require a highly trained team to pull it off. It's honestly hard to wrap your head around how people moved these enormous megaliths so long ago, but some people at some point in time clearly did. 
We just feel that the extreme examples at places like Tanis make it easy to question whether the dynastic Egyptians could have been the people who did it. While we're on the topic of moving huge stones in Egypt, there's another site though that's even more unbelievable, especially when you consider the orthodox explanation of how these enormous stones were transported. The Colossi of Memnon are believed to have been brought here not with a custom boat on the Nile River, but over land from almost 700 kilometers or more than 400 miles away. They come from the quartzite quarry near Cairo, on the other end of the country, and it's believed that they were too heavy to be pulled upstream against the current of the river. Just think about that for a second. These are some of the heaviest statues ever made in Egypt. Can you imagine thousands of men pulling them on sleds over uneven terrain for hundreds and hundreds of miles across the desert? It's hard to believe that it could even be done this way, and it's these kinds of artifacts that seem hard to fit into Orthodox history. The dynastic Egyptians themselves say that there were several great chapters of civilization long before their own epoch, and that their roots go all the way back to the first time, known as Zeptepi, a golden age when the gods themselves lived many thousands of years ago. Egyptologists label these stories as myths that can't possibly be real, but we wonder if they might be true. The Egyptians said that they descended from a people who survived a great cataclysm that flooded their homeland long ago, who later came to Egypt to rebuild the glory of the former age. As we mentioned in our first video on Tanis, there definitely was a global cataclysm with huge flooding at the end of the last ice age, around 13,000 years ago, and those events could have easily wiped out an advanced civilization. So could the stories be true? Are some of the greatest megalithic stones that we find in Egypt the surviving relics from a chapter long lost to history? It certainly is intriguing that no other culture has ever reproduced a monolithic stone statue so large. And it seems like maybe our orthodox model of history is missing important pieces of the puzzle that explain our full human story. We honestly may never know, but it's places like Tanis that add so much to the air of mystery around the ancient world and keep us coming back for more. So what do you guys think? Are the giant statues of Tanis an inherited legacy from an advanced ancient people long ago? Or was all of this created by the dynastic Egyptians? We would love to hear your thoughts on this, so please leave a comment below and tell us what you think. We don't mean to take anything away from the incredible dynastic Egyptian civilization, and if they did build the largest statues ever made in the history of the world, then our hats are off to them for creating such phenomenal stoneworks that would challenge even our own modern technology. But if it turned out that these great megalithic works were created long before what's currently accepted as the origins of civilization, it would be so fascinating and would add so much to our incredible human story. We're honestly not set on these ideas though, and we're really open to all possibilities. We're just super curious to learn, and we're happy to share our thoughts and experiences from our explorations of the amazing sights of the ancient world. Tanis really is a remarkable place, and you should totally go visit one day if you ever get the chance. We spent hours there exploring the ruins, our minds full of questions, and we left feeling a deep state of wonder about the origins of this fantastic ancient city. When the sun got low in the sky, we said our farewell and set off for the long four-hour journey back to Cairo, sweaty and dirty after another full day's adventure in the sun. To top the day off with a good laugh, we had the youngest bus driver we've ever seen, driving the minibus full of people back to the city. He looked like he was 14 years old. We watched the sun go down during the long drive, and we were relieved when we finally made it back to the bustling city of Cairo to have a good old warm bowl of koshery. It was another great day during our long trip in Egypt, and we're happy to share it with you, and we hope you guys enjoyed the video. Thank you so much for watching. It really does mean a lot to us. We're excited that our channel keeps growing and growing, and we'll be putting out a lot more content as time goes on, so stay tuned. Make sure you leave a comment below and tell us what you think. 
We enjoy interacting and learning from you all, and we're open to discussing all ideas about the mysteries of history. And feel free to head over to my website and check out my photos, music, and graphics. There are links in the description below, as well as a bunch of cool articles we read while making this video, and a PDF from a great little pamphlet that the archaeologist at Tanis gave us when we spoke to him. It's full of valuable information and definitely worth a read. Also, we hope that you enjoyed the music in this video that Milo and I recorded in a cave in Cappadocia, Turkey. Thank you again for watching, and don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel. Take care everyone, and we'll see you in the next video.